Chapter 32 Private Lessons. It was the second week of the hockey season. October still looked like summer, as far as the weather went. But everything had changed from the month before for Jerry. I'm just glad I made it, Jerry thought, primed and pumped to jump over the boards, to take his shift at practice. Next game, maybe I'll get in. It'll only be the third. That splinter stuff's for suckers. Nobody makes the team just to sit there and, and take up space. He convinced himself on the spot. Not if they don't want to. Jerry's thoughts were invaded by an unusually large peal of bird excrement. Nothing too unusual, witnessing one of Rip Rink's many winged lodgers let loose with a balletic bowel movement of the air. He had seen such a thing unfold before his own very eyes a handful of times. That time when Johnny Hinkle, his goalie in Pee Wee B, was famously doused with seagull leftovers during the national anthem. But this dropping seemed to have come from a pigeon. The bird mess landed splat in front of him, just the other side of the bench. In his mind, the smacking sound was louder than Harmon's call from across the rink. Change it up, he hollered. Jerry's line was up at practice. They were scrimmaging this morning for the full hour. Jackie Monahan was first over the boards. He would center. Creepy Green was on left wing. They were the third line. Although Jerry was absent, replaced on right by either Martin or Hank Stank Staniskowski in both Voyagers games so far that new 1971-72 season. Like Martin, Stank was a defenseman. Harmon just loved to throw blue liners up front. Walsh had accused him of being dyslexic. It came out sounding like licks dexic at best. Walsh only whispered it to Jack behind the coach's back. Harmon didn't hear him, and Jack didn't know what he meant, or even said for certain. Harmon, guys look stexic, man. Can't tell the back from the front, Sonny said under his breath. Jerry overheard it and, and snickered, it being only his first game wedged into the grain of the seat beneath him. Everyone had to know how to play up front, and behind for that matter, with everyone else. That was Harmon's philosophy. He'd call his occasional makeshift combos... Black deuces. Black aces, don't you mean? Sonny chided him. When Sonny found himself, pointedly it appeared, put up front with Ronnie Marco and Vazo on one particular shift, both of them defensemen. Deuces, Walsh, just what I said. Harmon told him back. Wouldn't want to bet a plug nickel on any of you three. Jerry lined up opposite Hank, who really did smell like low tide. One stick cracked against another and they were off. Off the face-off, Joe took control and looped back into his own zone. Jerry stuck with Hank. Methodically, carefully, Joe organized the attack. He got past Green, who brushed by him with a sweep check, skimming the length of his stick on the ice and just missing the puck. Hank was really digging in, stick down, motoring through the neutral zone, looking for a pass. Jerry matched him stride for stride, but Hank pulled in front as he crossed the blue line, and Joe zipped the puck ahead to him. The puck snapped as it met Hank's stick. Jerry was behind by a stride. The defense was caught. Hank had a clear lane in front of him, through the right circle and on to Flaherty's cage. Jerry had him in reach, and as Hank went to the net, Jerry used that reach, extending his stick towards Hank's rolling hips. Harmon ripped the air with his whistle, and play stopped. Lack! Now there is something that'll sooner get you skating back with bees than if you just showed up at the next practice. Harmon yammered. He pronounced lake, lack, but without cruelty. What Jerry found irksome to the point where he felt like he was standing in the middle of the school cafeteria wearing only worn-through underpants was Harmon's expression. He wore the smile that warped his face when Walsh randomly wrapped the boards with the puck looking for that spot. You're reaching, said Harmon. Lucky had told Jerry instead, You're spitting in my soup. Harmon played out a grotesque reenactment of what Jerry had just done. He spastically reached both arms out straight, holding them like they were in splints. He pushed at Jerry with the ends of them. You're reaching, he repeated. He dropped his hands and flung them right back out again for another demonstration, this time clattering his dangling stick against Jerry's. You can't catch your check if you're reaching for it. You're going to get beat every time. You've got to keep skating. You coast when you reach. The guy's ahead of you, so how can you catch him 
if you're coasting and reaching. Harmon did it again. Jerry was certain he, he did not look so awkward when he committed the offense. Understand? Harmon leered when he said it. Jerry nodded, but he did not completely understand. He saw other kids reach. The defenseman did it all the time. In his head, Jerry responded, he, even meekly to himself. What am I supposed to do? Just follow the guy? Not try to reach him? And I wasn't coasting. I, I was skating. Before Jerry completed his thoughts, Harmon was blowing the whistle not two feet from his ear to resume play. It was the first thing Harmon had said directly to him since making an example of Jerry at tryouts, calling him a leader, something Jerry could never understand, but also kind of liked to hear. It was also the last thing he had said to him until seven games into the season, when Harmon pulled Jerry aside prior to warm-ups before a home game. All the other boys were filing out to the rink from the locker room. Jerry and Harmon remained behind. Harmon blocked the doorway but did not shut the door. He stared down at Jerry until the last of his teammates had disappeared down the runway to the rink. Uh, just a minute, Jerry, before we go out there tonight, Harmon said. He was speaking more softly, more directly, to him, and in a way Jerry had never imagined that he would hear his coach speak. It's almost like we're friends, he thought. You're not playing yet, but I want you to know why you're on this team. Harmon said, his usually cold blue eyes emitted the warmth of a heated swimming pool. It's for something that you have. Can't go ignored, he said. I would be wrong to ignore it. Do you know what it is? He did not. Because you used to know my dad? Jerry let slip, not meaning to open his mouth. You used to, uh, still do. We go back, I, I told you that, Harmon said, distracted, waving his hand weakly in his favorite gesture. It's not because of your dad. And Harmon chuckled. Jerry felt oddly relaxed, like he was at the dentist, but had just found out that he did not have any cavities to drill. You can skate. You've got natural ability, Jerry. I can see it in the way that you skate. Simple as that. All the other things you, you still have to work on. But that's why I put you on the team. I can see. God gave you a natural ability. We can't let him down. Both were quiet for what seemed like minutes. Jerry felt like he was in church. Now get out there in a hurry. Don't let us down. Jerry rushed through the lobby, burst through the swinging doors, jumped the boards to the rink. He skated the tail end of warm-ups with a newly stoked furnace of hope roaring through his soul. He did wonder, though, whether Harmon's us included Jerry or just meant... Harmon and God. Only the furnace went cold that night. Lying in bed, Jerry mulled over Harmon's holy moment. The coach had sat him out his seventh of seven straight games. How can I not let him down if he won't even let me play? Jerry murmured this into his pillow. The last thing he thought before drifting off to sleep was how alike the hockey bench was to the pew at church church when he went, being a place he sat, watched and waited to go home again, with the Almighty bestride his every breath. Jerry didn't know what to make of Tommy's bad mouthing of the coach back at the pond. He, Jerry, certainly was more than a little of two minds about Harmon, but he, he's the only one to have ever put me on an A-team, Jerry thought as he walked home from the mill pond peeking around every corner, watching out for any car he might recognize passing by. He had a new appreciation for his backyard neighbors, the carpenters. Good thing they're never at home, he thought, with some comfort, slipping past a panting chief at the window. Maybe it was true. Most of the other guys thought the same thing, if not as purely as Tommy did. That did surprise him, the general harsh opinion of the man who held Jerry's fate, all of their fates, in his grip. He thought of the succession of coaches who had also held his heart come September, and then, every other year, just as surely discarded it, tossing it still beating under the rolling Zamboni at the end of tryouts. Were they all as inconsequential as Tommy had said? Every one of those coaches? To Jerry, they were most definitely not. They determined his whole life. The yes, the no, the stay or to go. 
and Harmon had told him that he had a gift from God. Returning to the pond the next day, he did not think he could pull off being with the boys again without one way or another one of the guys catching on. He stayed over with the figure skaters, much to their displeasure, but it was worth the sneers, the clucking of tongues, knowing he was safe and unnoticed. He skated circles, did stops and starts, stick-handled, so it got to be he didn't have to look at the puck at all by the end of the session which was something to say when dealing with bumpy pond ice. Progress, he thought. That was until the crew came to him. It was Tiny Jim who rushed over from the group of voyagers to enlist their newfound woolly-faced pal. Hey, man, thought that was you again, Jim said, gasping from his burst across the pond in goalie pads and flat fiberglass mask. Tommy saw you first, from way over there. You You know where we hang out? Man, he's got better eyes than anybody I know, except me, being a goalie and all. I saw you too, man. Jerry stopped circling to stand next to him, but not too close. Come on over with us. We're putting a game together. Come on, man, he said, forcing his invitation through the slit of a hole in the mask where his mouth should have been. Jim lumbered off, pads like two little wood stumps attached to his legs, waving Jerry along. Jerry had no choice but to again take the chance and skate with the boys. This time, though, it was all play and no talk. He felt that he'd lucked out. The constant movement would act as a part of his camouflage, as long as they all kept their eyes on the puck. Especially so, because another five or six teammates were out there, including Charles. He saw a bunch of B-team kids, too, who all knew him pretty well. A few were from his class in school. Jerry did no more than nod at any of them. He kept moving, kept skating up and down. When it was time for him to get going, he just tapped Tommy on the shin pads with his stick as he passed him on his way to the other end of the pond, where his boots and bag sat on top of the split log seat. Going? Already? We only just started. This'll go on all day! Tommy shouted to him while hovering away from the play. Don't feel so good still, huh? Well, take care of that cold, kid. Maybe hear you talk back one day. Hey, maybe even find out your name. He joined a rush to the net. Jerry heard Walsh call out behind Tommy. Yeah, who was that masked man? The next thing Jerry heard as he attempted to skate clear was Charles, who he had made strenuous efforts to avoid during the entire skate. Charles, who knew him better than anybody. Charles and a few others trailed right behind him, dropping out of the shinny for a break. Jerry did not turn around. You know him, Sonny? Charles said, more amused than curious. He raised his voice as if he was calling out to the him as he pointed at Jerry's back. Just a new kid who hung out with us a little, that's all, answered Sonny, now sounding disinterested. Seems like a pretty good kid, Tommy said, only he doesn't talk. Yeah, got Lairjit. A cold or something, Walsh continued. Funny thing, said Charles, gliding to a halt and watching as Jerry drifted across the pond, moving fluidly to the distance, looking as if he were rolling. A boy on a bicycle, effortlessly crossing over a smooth new bed of hot blacktop on a summer's day. Funny thing is, see? He skates just like Jerry. And Charles aimed the butt end of his stick out in front of him, What did he say his name was? Didn't say. That's what I mean, said Sonny. Who was that masked man? Jerry decided he could not run into the Voyagers again, especially Charles. He'd never fool him a second time. It was a strange mystery to him how they did not know it was him. He felt like when it was Halloween and he was dressing up for a visit to his grandparents, with his parents, as a small child. Like they're not going to know, he thought. It was a wakeful dream, skating out there with his rink clan incognito, but also creepy as a deep nightmare played out in broad daylight. No way. He could not return to the pond. But Jerry had already accomplished his mission. He had gotten out to skate plenty that week, the week of no school and no cops out to ruin his plan. He had spent more than two hours skating each time. He felt almost up to speed. Funny how quickly it all comes back, he thought. That pond hockey scrimmage was crazy, and I kept up. 
It was worse than any game I'll ever play in. No bench to rest on either. Jerry stared down Chief, looking out at him with sad and greedy eyes through the neighbor's back window. He was only steps from his own back door. Jerry tiptoed around the rear of his garage. He glanced down the driveway. No car. He edged to the front of the house. No car there either. Home safe. He was getting this sneaking around business down to a science. He ditched his equipment in the garage, and as he entered the kitchen, he didn't know what worried him more. How he was going to skate again unobserved, or whether it mattered that he did. Am I ever really going to get back on the team, he thought, locking the kitchen door behind him. Hope was with him, though. Bob had blessed him with that. So in his mind, he pressed on. Taking off his boots, he walked three steps in stocking feet. Opposite the refrigerator, he stopped. There was a note, a note written large in red marker, and stuck so he could never miss it onto the front of the dark green refrigerator door. But he did miss it. Must have, he thought. He'd come down from his room and, and had his cereal that morning. After his parents had both gone, he'd opened the fridge to get his milk. And he had also eaten a brick-sized portion of apple and blueberry pie that was sitting for him on the top shelf of the same fridge. He was in and out of the refrigerator three and four times before he left for the mill pond with the same fridge door that had the most conspicuous of notes attached to it, stuck on the front with a life-sized sunflower-shaped magnet. The note, he noticed, was signed by his mother. His head began to swim. Mom! he yelled into the empty house. It had to be an empty house, he thought. Where are the cars? He pulled the note from the fridge door. No, he convinced himself. It had to have been there already, just like with Dad's car in the driveway the other time. Sunflowers so big must have just not seen the paper. Must have had pie on the brain. I love that stuff. Reading the first line, he began to sleepwalk into the living room. Dropping down to the couch to read the note a second time, he had not only exited his kitchen, but he was not really in his living room anymore either, nor in his house. Cold, wet, and needing to take a hot bath, Jerry was no longer on the same planet he inhabited before trekking off to skate, before coming home, before plucking the note his mother had left for him from the refrigerator door. The couch was a cloud, below his feet a vast, sweet green meadow of rolling hills, sunlit in a caramel glow. He kept reading what he had already read. Jerry, hi, hon. Didn't want to wake you up, but had to let you know. First, I have errands and won't be home as usual, probably more like 4.30. But second, we just found out this morning, very early, that you are going to have some help with your homework. Remember, like we talked about? You'll be back at school very soon, so the principal and your teachers and counselor and dad and I thought it would be good if you had a little head start to help you catch up. The school is sending a tutor by today to drop off a new assignment for you, a senior straight A's honor student. And guess what? It's someone you already know. Remember Helen Bell, the nice girl we had for a sitter when you were little? You used to like it when we had her keep an eye on you when we went out. She's going to be your tutor. So she might drop by before I get home from work. I have to shop. She should be there by 2.30 or so. Love, Mom, and Dad, too. Jerry's wildest dreams were leapfrogged by fate. Nell Bell was coming over to see him. She had to. Jerry was her assignment, and she his. He held the note. No longer reading it, he just gazed at her name. Time stopped, and time rushed past like a wide river that looked static from a long distance up, like when viewed from his miles-high perch on the couch, which was now cushions, upholstery, slipcovers, and the rest, transformed into a private cloud nine, right in his own living room. Jerry looked at the standing clock in the corner. He did not hear it, but it must have just struck one. He stared at the paper, and the same name was still there, the same girl's name he had written onto pieces of paper over and again over the years. 
on to pretend valentines that had never made it into an envelope. Written onto paper he had then torn into such small pieces that it pinched and stung his fingertips to finish ripping them apart. But here it was in front of him, that same name. Here it had a purpose. It was real, and, and he did not have to hide it. The name had a face, two green eyes that gave him deep sea shivers whenever he dove inside them, which was next to never, he knew. She'd have to at least look back at him for that. Yet he floated on the current of her voice, a voice that if it was aimed at him might just cave in his entire frame. Nell Bell. Out of nowhere, the whole wrapped package was on its way. High as he already was, Jerry rose still further. He clambered upstairs on all fours to take the quickest, sudsiest shower of his life. Cleaned up, he pulled on his best top, a new, not yet worn, light blue turtleneck cashmere sweater, the one he got for Christmas from his well-to-do aunt up in Boston. Jerry saw that it was now 2.15. He went to the kitchen. His eyes careened around the room and stopped on the calendar. He was stunned to find that the Valentine's Day square in the middle of it had passed, and for the first time he could remember without him dwelling on Nell on that day. He didn't know what that meant now that he was nearly panting in anticipation of seeing her. She was four years older than him, and though the raw numbers out of whack as they were never really registered with him, Jerry always felt the age gap was more like multiples of four to her, like the lasting attraction to her was some science fiction creation, dreamt up in the banned and hidden basement laboratory of his mind, a bubbling chamber of honeyed scents and warm pastel lights, not quite concealed behind a half-opened iron door, yet still a place within himself where even he was not allowed to go, a place that both cheered his cheeks rosy and frightened his insides ash white. Not that the real three-dimensional living, breathing Nell ever said so. She never actually said to him, Listen, kid, you're like, huh, how old? Now just blow away, little boy, will you? How could she? She may have had fifty words for him in all the time he had known her. Except for one time, he did remember. It was when she had asked him, what he liked to do. And he said, Play hockey. That's my favorite thing Everest to do. He was nine years old. That was the first time she spelled his parents, who were attending a wedding in town. It was a sunny, unusually hot and humid late September afternoon. Jerry was sitting on the grass in the backyard with Nell, who he thought was already grown up. Ever, Jerry. Favorite thing ever. Favorite thing of all. Nell corrected him, smiling with her eyes. The corners of her wide mouth barely registered the kindness her eyes were painting him with. She continued, Or most favorite thing, or favorite thing most of all. There are a hundred ways to tell me what you like. And then she smiled with her whole face, eyes and mouth, teeth out to play, dimples shouting something wonderful in his ears. Do you know what I like to do? She said, the bestest and mostest of all? Shaken, but just a little bit, he did not know if she was making fun of him or playing with him like you would with a little child. You mean... You mean what you like to do most, he said, nose in the air, feigning what he thought was indignation. They both laughed. So, now you're too old for baby talk? Serves me right, she said. I'll tell you anyway. My favorite thing is dance. Do you know what that is? Of course he did. And was Jerry ever impressed? Sure I do, he said, eyes wide and practically hyperventilating. But you mean what you like to do is dance, right? So what kind of dances do you like to do? Like Boogaloo and, and the Monkeys uh, Swim and Mashed Potato and Watusi and Twist? I know them, like on Hullabaloo, or Shindig, and Bandstand, where the action is. You watch them, too? I bet you like to dance to them a lot. Like all the time, huh? She laughed in his face. When Nell stopped laughing, she said, No, 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 you dolt. That's a uh, discotheque dancing. Silly, aren't you? 
Guess so. But don't you like that kind of dancing, like on TV? When I'm in the mood, sure. I go out for that. But that's not what I mean, doltish boy. He took this as teasing and liked it. What do you mean, he said. And Jerry was really saying, what can you mean? Not aware of sound and movement beyond his TV, radio, and records. You mean like old-time tap dancing, he said. Musical kind of shows and uh, that stuff? I mean ballet. Do you know what that is? Nell delicately scolded, coldly, while at the same time covering her words with a warm and brittle, sugary edge, like a spoken creme brulee. Oh, that, he said and left it right there, floating in the void of his knowledge of the balletic arts. Nell was alert, upright and poised, but completely still. Sitting on the grass opposite him, only her mouth and facial features moved. Still, it was as if she was speaking from mid-stride of the dance she spoke of, as she began to unwind description upon description of her company's current production, Hansel and Gretel. She was that vibrant, just sitting there. Nell didn't make a gesture, not one sweep of an arm. She appeared to Jerry to be lifting off the ground all the same, though she did not shift an inch. All the good stuff, most all of it, is right up in the air, you know? Either with leaps or, or just by the way we're trained to move our feet. We've got names for all these things, but you sort of flutter so that whatever step you take, it's like you glide, like you're floating free over the stage whenever you move. Wow! Wow! Just like skating, Jerry said, truly taken. Just like you're flying. It is flying, without wings, she said, with a giggle that he could feel. It was the opposite of laughing at him, as she had set out doing, and he knew the difference right away. The sound tickled at the back of her throat, and he felt like it was meant to be tickling him, too. When she spoke of flying, Nell's words now made the cool center of her creme brulee voice suddenly melt into a smooth custard. Jerry thought the dish was his. And I love it, she said. So there's your answer, Jerry. Ballet. It's the most fantastic thing I could ever do. Jerry knew what she was talking about. He had seen ballet on television. And he knew all about the Christmas one, as he thought of it. With the dancing mice and everything? The Nutcracker. He'd seen that on TV just the last Christmas, 1965, or at least most of it. But what she was communicating to him, and what beamed out over the box the minutes that he saw ballet last December were as alike as a stuffed animal and a real live bear, Nell, to Jerry, being the breathing creature. Wow, that's really something, flying like that. Never thought of it that way, Jerry burst out. But yeah, I, I know just what you mean. I saw it on TV. They danced, ballet danced, to all the Christmas songs. Uh, sugar Plum Fairies. The Nutcracker. We're doing that next Christmas, she gushed. We? Me? And the other dancers? The company. Company? Jerry shrugged, thinking he or she misunderstood, wondering what a store or factory building had to do with dancing. A big old building like Rip Rink. Maybe that's where they practice, he imagined. Nell's We was the foremost youth dance company in the state, one she belonged to since she was six years old. She nodded at Jerry, got up to go into the kitchen to pour a drink of iced tea, and asked him if he wanted a glass. Then, just before walking to the back door, she looked down at him and said, You know, don't you? You play hockey, you said. We, as in team, as in we, myself, and I. That was the only true chat he ever remembered having with her. Most times, if they were together... Her sitting would consist of them doing just that and nothing else. Sitting in front of the television until it was time for him to go to bed, or until his parents returned. And Nell, being as young as she was, his parents never had her on duty for more than a few hours at a time, with a backup phone number of their most trusted neighbor in case of an emergency, which never occurred. This is what he knew of Nell. All else he knew of Nell was that, now at fourteen and going on fifteen, He'd ended up hung up on her something terrific. Knowing her? That only meant knowing her name, what she looked like, where she lived, what her main preoccupation was, which was floating through the air on tiptoes. 
Since she stopped babysitting for him, the only times he set eyes on Nell were when he would be at Charles's house. Nell and Kate would march by, either coming or going from Kate's room. It was like watching for a rare species with binoculars. But what a turn of events going to Riverview High would bring, and he thought of it often before it actually came about. He waited, and that September of 1971, he found himself at last in the same school as Helen Nell Bell. The four times he saw her at school that late summer and autumn, those being the four times he saw her and was positive that she saw him back, he was convinced that if he did not say hi first, then she would have walked right by him. He knew it was four times because he counted them, kept track, meaning he also knew that two of those times he did not manage to coil up the courage to say hi, and that on those occasions she did pass him by without a glance. If Nell was a horse, it would have required a set of wide blinkers to stop her from noticing him coming her way. She's got to have a special filter in her head, he thought. It still crinkled his brow to recall that within the time and space of one of those encounters, the last, Nell brushed past him. She pivoted and sidestepped him, like she was automatically moving through one of her ballet passes at a particularly low-key, run-of-the-mill rehearsal, where she had already nailed down every step a month before time. First, though, before she slipped by, slowing almost to a stop along a tight and crowded turn between the door to Jerry's science class and the hallway leading to her next class, however briefly, the space between them closed up completely. He felt the skin of her bare wrist swipe against his sleeveless forearm, and his heart lurched. Had he ever touched her before? Nell's face, the cheek of which was all but close enough to rub his own, filled his eyes, and he could see nothing else. A satin warmth lit up his skin. His insides were awash with a sugary solution, a frothy mocha malted and cinnamon mix. It was like his widened eyes had absorbed and shot his system through with a confection made of her subtly freckled face. But in an instant, that honeyed sensation turned to sickly and not so sweet, when Nell's mouth bloomed into a nonplussed pout that said, without words, Get out of my way, you little twerp. In no hurry, she looked straight ahead, not at him. Yet, he thought, she was clearly directing a gesture his way. Jerry entered room 901 of Mr. Dimmon's introductory biology, thinking of the sickly and the sweet. He'd felt them back to back, the latter from her touch, the former when she would not look at him. They'd happened so fast, he thought, it's almost like it was both at the same time. The next hour, while sitting in science class, staring at a Bunsen burner, as if it held the answer, Jerry himself burned to know how both sensations could mix so merrily inside of him. And if that wasn't enough, the bloated fact that she well and truly had babysat for him, was going to make him feel like he had just wet his pants the instant he opened the front door to her. So he busied himself in preparing for her arrival, trying not to give the babysitting and brushing by him at school discomfort the room to take over his thoughts. She won't go for hot chocolate or a root beer like, like some little kid, Jerry thought. She's already 18. I bet she drinks real beer. Wine, anyway. Probably. Shall I ask her if she wants a glass of wine? I know where Dad keeps all the bottles. Better not. No, that's nutty. She's from Riverview Heights, like Charles, and she would drink the expensive stuff anyways. And I don't think that's what Dad has in his cellar. I know he's got Mr. Renetti's homemade bottles stored down there. There aren't even any labels on them. She'd think I was trying to poison her or something. The heck with it. I'll make her fresh coffee. She'll like that. Jerry had never made coffee before, but he had seen his mother do it enough. So he poured the sliding grounds from a black and red can into the pot, added the water from the tap at the sink, and put it onto the lit stove. He forgot to first load the pot with the stemmed metal filter. His initial rush of elation was fast turning into an edgy, jangling nervousness. It gnawed at his ribs. He kept darting to the front window in the living room, then back again to the kitchen to watch the percolator. 
By the time it began to boil, of course it could not possibly percolate, he was scared witless. He demanded of himself, What am I going to say? What am I going to say to her when she, when she, uh, when she gets here? The news posted on the fridge that had first sent his spirits rocketing over the moon now made Jerry wish he was up there for real and cowering in a crater. He heard the doorbell ring. Jerry's ears rang with it. He closed his eyes for a moment, hoping to keep them from hopping out of his head at first sight of her. The bell rang again. He opened his eyes back up, noticing that coffee grinds were oozing from the top and rolling down the sides of the gurgling pot. It sounded like a boiling mud puddle. He turned down the flame and the doorbell rang for a third time. He ran from the kitchen. Before he could reach the front door, the bell ringing was followed in its reverberations by the same number of short raps of the black metal door knocker. Rapid fire and fierce, like someone slaying a small but dangerous creature by battering it against the front door. Jerry swung the front door open. Her hair was pinned back, thatched into plaits, leaving the scalp line of her brow with a ravaged, jagged, plowed appearance. Indians in the movies went into battle wearing their hair just like that. Jerry, too, immediately noticed. She wore a huge two-sizes-too-big yellow and black warm-up jacket over what he could see from her bottom half down was her dance leotard. She held up a pile of books of all sizes in both hands out in front of her, shifting from foot to foot, her feet punctuating long and sturdy legs encased in chalky white tights. Her chin was propped on the top book, a heavy bound and nondescriptly covered geometry text. Nell Bell shot him a blank but open look, the kind of first glance a mother would give her infant child were she to discover it picking up, then attempting to eat, a bug in the backyard. She did not smile. Hi, Nell. Um, you're here now, huh? Jerry said. Then Jerry realized what he had said heard it echo back through some dull corridor in his mind. He could smell his boiling over coffee grounds burning on the stove. He felt ill. Yes, I'm here now. How are you? Nell said, polite, alert, her oval penny-tinted face animated in hasty, almost testy communication. Her voice had a textured edge that he immediately found confounding. As she spoke to him, an unlikely amalgam of burlap and corduroy cuffed at his ears. I need to give you a few things from school. Your parents should have told you that I was coming, did they? Can I come in? He did not remember this voice. Despite himself, he grinned. She still did not. Stood up in front of Jerry, framed by the doorway, Nell was a good inch or two shorter than he had thought her to be. Looking as if she might drop the books at any second, she stepped forward, huffing and grimacing, and tipped all of them into Jerry's not-ready-and-waiting arms. He dropped the whole bunch. Oh, he blurted. Oh, look what you've done, she said. Come on, let, let's get all this inside. I, I don't have too much time, you know. Nell crouched to gather up the squall of school books and papers. She glanced a dagger up at Jerry, still standing. Now hovering over her, he caught the look squarely up the nostrils and snorted and blinked. Nell kept talking as she scooped the books striking his brow with the same arrow-tipped glances intermittently as she spoke. Well, aren't you going to help? She said softly. I was told you were better, almost ready to go back to school now. That's why I was sent here with all your new assignments. I am very, very busy right now with school and exams and, and a new show opening in, in only another week. She bared her teeth in what could never be construed as a grin. But I said I would do it. They have a list of honor students who, who they ask. I think your mom asked. Your mom's a nice lady. She used to have me babysit for you. Remember? Nell crinkled her mouth and nearly smiled. I hardly remember doing that at all, though. That was a long while ago. I think I must have sat for every kid in town at one time or another. You know Charles? I'm best friends with his big sister, Kate. I used to watch him, too. The little stinker. I think I remember coming back here a... A couple of times back then, she looked up at the door knocker like it was a member of the family and she had just recalled its name. Yep, sure did. It was about the same time I was sitting for Charles. Charles is my best friend. Hey, on the hockey team. We call him Cannonball, Jerry said, 
reaching for common ground and feeling the actual ground he stood on crumbling heel to toe. You came here to baby... Uh, uh, I had to sit for my parents sometimes, mostly in the summer, like three years in a row, I remember. Jerry beamed, while not saying, but thinking, I remember how I couldn't wait for you to get here. Crouched over the front steps still, she stopped gathering books and scattered paper. How could I babysit for your parents? She said, looking deeply into the cover of the top book. The stack of books and papers almost all back in order, she continued to pause, both hands leaning on the top book of the pile. Nell exhaled a long breath and looked up at Jerry with an expression as empty as her flushed lungs. I, I mean to, like, look after me. Uh, for them, y you know. Jerry backpedaled bashfully. Oh, well, I can't remember too much about it. I know I used to come here. She switched her attention back to the books. Anyway... Your mother asked the school if I could do this, and so here I am. And she got up, pointedly leaving a pair of books still on the ground. Facing Jerry and standing close, Nell turned her mouth up into a curve, warming her strong features to room temperature, or at least to a just-outside-the-front door version of the same. It was an expression so short-lived that Jerry wondered whether he had really seen her smile at him or not. He stared back. She keeps talking to me, he thought enthralled, as if Nell was engaging him in heartfelt conversation on a subject of the deepest mutual interest. It mattered not to him that her tone was more in line with a dog walker, who natters at a pooch while taking the thing out to pee on a tree. He broke his trance to pick up the last two books. Can I go in? She asked, suddenly smiling as wide as her features would permit before just as quickly shrinking her mouth down to a tight little line. They went inside. She shut the door. Nell walked straight over to the couch. She never made one wasted movement. Clearing aside a clutter of diamond-shaped cushions, with one hand she dropped all the books in her arms down at once. Now then, Cherry, here is what your homeroom teacher, Mrs. Helmquist, has given me to give to you. Nell produced a typewritten sheet of paper pulling it from the front pages of the geometry book where she had stored it for safekeeping. It had torn along the top in the fall, but the typing was undisturbed. She has organized all of your assignments from all of your other teachers. These lessons are assignments. Either reading or essays, whatever they are, are all the same work that your classmates are doing at their desks right now, okay? And she kept looking at the paper, doing no more than dash a glance over Jerry's shoulder as she went on. I've been told you have been working on your own assignments for the last month or, or so right here at home? Two months, kind of. My mom picks them up from school, Jerry said, wanting to ask her if she would like a cup of fresh coffee. Maybe she'll ask, he thought. The house is stinking of it. Is it burning? He put down the two books and stepped two backwards paces towards the kitchen and stopped. Nell looked at him like she was seeing right through the back of his scarred scalp, then straight on to the kitchen, her stare knifing a path past the erupting coffee grounds that had to be piled up overhead in there by now. The reek of the beans was that pungent. And then seeing out through the back of the house to the carpenter's backyard, Chief would bound away from his window and hide low on the floor to avoid the look Nell was leveling in both Jerry and his backdoor neighbor's direction. But Jerry's gaze was not so deep. All he saw were her eyes. Two months, okay, but wait. And she drew back her see-through look to close range so that she was blasting him with what he considered to be the full smoky pine forest green glory of her eyes. And are you all right now? Nell asked. How's the, you know, your head? How are you feeling? How did he feel? That was the one question that had crisscrossed his mind since he first opened the door to her. As if it were another surprise guest itself, arrived side by side with Nell. It stood next to her by the couch as he prowled the contours of Nell's mangled, idiosyncratic to the dance crew hairdo. He sized up the oversized athletic warm-up overcoat that screamed Riverview Dance Troupe in a formless swath of letters and folds, and he saw the choked-off, otherwise able and statuesque legs sealed like sausage beneath the heavy, dull, dirty white tights. The sneakers, 
laces undone that made her feet look like they were a pair of summer's refugees roaming the winter plain. How did he feel? Jerry's first muddled emotion since seeing Nell standing there outside the front door boiled with one question. What makes me like this girl so much? Well, are you okay now? Are you listening? She frowned and sat on the couch, waiting for a response. He was listening all right. He wanted to keep right on listening for as long as she would keep talking. To him. Oh, I'm all right. No problem at all. I've been all right for a long time, really. Can't wait to get back to skate. Uh, uh, back to school. Back to school with you, Nell, he thought. Where you won't brush by me anymore either, will you? Back at school for the rest of the semester. For the rest of the school year when, when now... We'll really know each other, too. We'll see each other in the hall and, and stop and, and talk. For the moment, though, Jerry would start off slowly. He'd make a baby step towards his one-time babysitter. I, I, I made some coffee. Can I get you a cup? Do you want some sugar in it? Cream? Jerry asked in what he thought was a cool, unbothered voice. Nell's mouth pressed tight. Her face still replied plainly, What? Nell shook Jerry's use bleat from her ears and then gave him his answer. No, said Nell, twice as cool and unbothered as Jerry thought he'd sounded when he had asked her. He stopped just short of the kitchen, looked back at her, and stepped with a single stride back into the living room. Nell stayed fixed, leaning slightly on her right hip, looking twice as bored as when she had arrived. She looked at Jerry. He looked back. But now it was Jerry who was looking through her, without wanting or intending to. Nell faded into the background of the living room furniture as Jerry searched for his breath. No, he said in one vast, empty syllable that made his mouth feel hollow as a bat's stone alcove, absent any bats. But I made it, especially for you. He was too scared to say her name. I mean... You know, um, cause you were coming, I, I made it. Jerry stuck his hands into his armpits, crossing his arms over his chest. He was lost. Are you sure? He said. I'm sure, said Nell. Already had some this morning. I'll leave you with this list of assignments and books and, and here is my phone number if you have any problem. Okay? Nell looked past him, but I don't think you will. It's just lots of reading assignments this week, and I know you can read and write, right? She smiled, but not at him, made her way for the door. Jerry thought of all the Valentine's Day's cards he had written in his head and never sent to her. The tall clock rang its single chime for forty-five minutes past the hour of two. Nell's visit had lasted so far less than five minutes. Three more seconds were pasted on to that discouraging total when she stopped at the front door to hand Jerry his list of assignments and her phone number, which his mom surely already had, and he was already too intimidated to use. Where are you going? Jerry thought. Aren't you supposed to tutor me? Aren't we going to sit on a couch together and, and open the books? What about the coffee? Jerry asked again. No, said Nell, again, bored and distant. Call me a killjoy. My friends do. Well, next time, Jerry said, immediately failing to comfort himself. There was a rigid quality to her voice that worried him more than even Harmon's glacial scolding. A strained edge in her voice that let him know this was the same sound she would be making to tell him to drop dead at any time she chose. Only the letters of the words themselves would change. She was still just brushing right by him in the hallways at school. Now it was with words, and with her eyes and expression, as she stood alone in front of him in his living room. And the words she did deliver were let loose at a pace. Her sentences were tilting, falling, and clattering strings of linguistic dominoes. The last one's tumbling left all the rest flat, still, all said and done. Jerry had a strong sense that the meter, some meter, somewhere, a meter that allotted this girl a set number of words to release in any given time frame, was always ticking down to its last talk. He did not yet know what constituted flirting, but it couldn't be this. He was sure. He thought she'd probably be smiling more if it did. Hope you feel better, she said, without revealing any feelings. 
Nell held the list out for Jerry to take. I don't think you'll be using this. She reminded him, almost dropping the torn out bit of loose leaf paper that also had her phone number on it, the this, to the floor. Jerry flung out his hands as the paper floated down. He was quick and able to clasp onto it at a height just above his knees, like catching a dying, pale, blue-striped butterfly as it fell from her fingertips. I'm late for rehearsal, she said, and she was gone. Bye-bye.